Live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world, you are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Naham Klegman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 30 of the From Entrepreneur. Today, I have an interview with the founder of Bottom Line Marketing Group, an author, radio host, Yitzchak Saftlas. Yitzchak, I want to welcome you to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Nachum. This is a treat and an honor. Well, it's a, the pleasure is mine. The pleasure is going to be our audience. I, you know, I've been learning more about you guys, what you've been doing, what you're up to, and uh, especially your new book that's out. So why don't you just give us a little bit of an overview about what Bottom Line Marketing Group is all about, and then uh, we'll dig in a little bit more about you, and then we'll uh, take it forward. Amazing. So again, thank you so much for having me. Bottom Line Marketing Group began in 1992. So going back a while, this is uh, 24 years, actually. We're about to enter year 24. Um, wow. Yeah. I, I had but gone. Like yes. You're sold. So <laughs> we don't reveal the age on the air. <laughs> so uh, I had gone to FIT. Not that, uh, you know, every, any particular person who would entertain going to, uh, you know, a, a, a secular school obviously should speak with their Rav, obviously. Um, but I had gone with another from person. We were like a shimer for each other. And we That's had. Yeah, so that that's an important note to know, especially. I mean, this is going back 25 years. Today, it's Allah has come of a comma. I had gone there for two years in continuing ed. I was learning in the morning and then going in the afternoon, continuing ed, which is uh, also a different group of people because it's uh, not people that are there in the entire day. It's people usually that are working. So it's a it's a different group of people. I'm even Yavin. We were there in 88, 89, and then. I had uh, gotten an offer actually through a good friend of mine and a good friend of everyone in Klai Yisrael, Rabbi Pesach Krohn, uh, very close to him. And, and, and he knew about an offer. He knew about a, a, a intern position at Art Scroll. So I worked at Art Scroll from 89 to 92. And then we started Bottom Line in nine. Uh, in the art department, working on covers, working on. I was there. Very exciting when uh, when the with the um, the Gemara project, the the Talmud, of course, the famous now. The everyone who doesn't know about the Schottenstein edition. I was there sure. at the very beginning, the development of the project. Um, that really exactly. my first masech that I learned was Makos. Uh, which I happen to be learning now, 25 years later. Mm-hmm. That's the first sect that I learned uh, back when I was in the Ve 25 years ago because of the Art School Gemara. Just yeah. made it somewhat, you know, took something that was like, seemed so impossible and made it possible. Absolutely. I mean, no one could take away from uh, Art School's accomplishments. They certainly from the, uh, you know, a, a revolution of sorts. Uh, I mean, of sorts. I mean, it, it's the art school revolution is a revolution on what it accomplished for Klai Yisrael. Rabbi Zlatowicz is a visionary, Rabbi Zlatowicz, Rabbi Sherman, and Rabbi Brander are visionaries. And uh, I was like to be part of that team for three years. And and when you say, it's interesting, Marcus, Marcus was the first edition they came out with, actually. Uh, right. in, fa- in fact, I'm not sure if you have it. I have an edition that was before Schottenstein. <laughs> on the oh, really? Yeah. They, that's like, uh, I guess, a collector's you know item at this point. I'm sorry? You know what you could get for that on eBay? <laughs> I didn't post it yet, but I guess after this interview, I should. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. And then in 92, started uh, in my parents' basement. And that's, uh, you know, as they say, humble beginnings. And uh, that's the way anyone really should look at any type of opportunity. You know, we live in a world where uh, the media will glorify someone who's, uh, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs, right? The guy who's, you know, in two years became, uh, you know, became a billionaire. Right. It, it just doesn't work like that. Again, there are exceptions and that proves that the Rebbe Shalom runs the world. Hashem could do whatever he wants. But in chan- so I'm sorry. What's funny is that a lot of these guys are Jewish, but not from a lot of these guys that seem to to make up these big companies. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's Google uh, and Facebook and Salesforce and LinkedIn and PayPal and you know the list goes on and on. Yeah, I, I mean it, it's it's the concept in general that 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 someone could uh, be paid off or win the lottery or make it quick, uh, you know, go from zero to a billion. It can happen. But in general, people should know that's not the road. <laughs> right now, it's important to stress that because yeah. I think there was even a, a quote from uh, Ben Brofman, right, a famous attorney. And, and I think he said it, it took 40 years to become an overnight success. 
Yes, and, and, beautiful. And, 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 it's, and it's an important quote because people, you know, look at people who, who made it, Baruch Hashem, successful, and almost like, yeah, you know, I, I can't, they don't realize the, the road, the path that it takes, the years, the, the hours, the investment of time and money and resources and kayak, it does take them, there are no shortcuts for, for that. So on, on bottom line, uh, just fast forwarding, we, um, you know, Baruch Hashem moved to Prince of Basin in 95, uh, moved to our first place on Coney Island, expanded our staff, keep on fast forwarding. We added internet in uh, 98, 99, we moved again. I'll skip to 05. 05 was uh, a, a, a kind of an important year because we did Bloomberg for mayor uh, in New York. So that was a particular... Well, something, there's probably a few agencies now. I'm not sure. Remember, he ran three times. So he right. ran a one, five, and nine. Uh, I was not involved in the O one or O nine race. So there mm-hmm. may have been others, but in O five we handled the Jewish demographic, and that was for direct mail, literature, and you know, and, and strategy. So that was an important year. And then in O six already we moved to we, we bought a building, and now we're we moved in in O seven. So just quickly about bottom line itself, we specialize in three particular areas, corporate, nonprofit, and political work. Corporate accounts include, you know, both within the Hamish world and in the general world and the nonprofit side. That's uh, primarily what we're known for because we, Baruch Hashem, do many, many newsletters for many Meistas. Each one is unique. Each one is approached, you know, with an independent, fresh perspective in order to bring out what that Meistad represents. We do a lot of books. We're Zeichel to do work for Dirshu. That's a very big schus of ours. Uh, on a personal level, I uh, was very close to Rabbi Vigda Miller, Zatzal. And and therefore, you know, a lot, I actually still listen to Shiram on, on a daily basis. But the reason why I point to that is that any work that we do for a nonprofit, while it's true, we're a marketing firm and it's paranoso for us, but of course it's a great schus and we don't minimize it at all. Meaning there's, 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 there's a real schus factor to, to be able to promote, whether it's for the fundraising, recruitment, the branding, I know we'll get into that a little later. And the political side is uh, always interesting. Bloomberg, another campaign we'll talk about a little later probably is the Bob Turner race. So that's a, uh, a brief nutshell about some of the work we've done and about bottom line itself. It's um, basically in a nutshell, getting to know our client, getting to know what they're all about and what they're trying to accomplish either through sales or through fundraising or through branding, etc. And then putting together the entire team in order to properly communicate that message to the intended recipient. Okay, so we're going to dig into bottom line in uh, just a few moments, but just a little bit more about yourself. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school, yeshiva, that type of thing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Flatbush, I think I was born in Manhattan, but my parents uh, were in Queens till I was four. Then Flatbush all the way straight. I've been in Flatbush since uh, since I was four. Uh, yeshiva, I went to, yeah, I went to um, uh, Yeshiva Tavar Salim Alech. For elementary, from a sifta, I was in Adelphia, very close to uh, Ravi Rucham Shane, Rav David Trank. Yeah, that's my short story. And and, wow. and, and for base Medrash, for many years, uh, and I still have a very close Kesha to uh, Rav Zelig Friedman and Flatbush. He gives, uh, I mean, he's a very, very special individual. He's a uh, allergist, a doctor by trade, but he gives approximately 25 to 30 hours of shurim a week. Wow. And yeah, he's uh, a real Sadiq, a real Nister. And so I. Well, not more. I'm sorry? Not anymore. Not after mentioning on this well, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And if anyone. Uh, he, Secrets out. Yeah. He, and he gives Shiurim, I mean, literally round the clock, I mean, 30 hours a week of Shiurim. Um, and he's right there in East Ninth between OMP and the door's always open. And he just gives Shiurim, you know, and, and he's. Uh, I've been close to him. And he was the one actually where I was when I was in FIT. That's where I was going in the morning. But even as uh, a balabas, I still uh, maintain a close cashier and attend many of his shirim. He, he gives shirim a lot on, on his industry, like on health and... Uh, no, it's yeah. primarily Gemara shirim. I mean, he has a, a steady uh, Ahmed Yemi shir. And then he gives, right. you know, every day he has a specific schedule, like on Mondays, I think it's Kedushin and then Archas Chaim and uh, Archas Sadikim. I mean, because he has halacha also on, 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 on other days, but he has a set schedule and... It's open for any balabas and even base matters age through. Uh, he's had people there that were in their 90s. So wow. it's just uh, very, so I, I definitely avail myself and encourage anyone to uh, avail themselves, whoever lives in Flatbush. But yes. Great. So how did you get into marketing? Like, were you always, you know, as a youngster, 
always into marketing, promoting stuff. Like, how? Why marketing? Yeah. So, <laughs> I know I shouldn't say this on the air, and and I say this tongue in cheek, but uh, the uh, standard answer is doodling in the Gemara. But <laughs> but, uh, but that's I don't want to. Yeah, would this, say that. That's not. Uh, that's just tongue in cheek. Um, right. The I had always enjoyed drawing, and it's interesting. I had taken an aptitude test, and when I was after high school, and it came up that you know those nakudas about communication, about art, had come up very strong, and that's when I decided to pursue you know, t- taking those courses at FIT. Mm-hmm. But still, you know, being a good artist and a designer is not the same as actually running a business with employees and, you know, everything that that entails. Right. So that's it's very interesting. Your show, which is called The Frum Entrepreneur, is actually a great name because entrepreneur, as we know, is someone that that has a particular vision and then starts putting things together. Now, many entrepreneurs have have training many don't have training my background had been not necessarily i didn't take courses on business management rather right. i had i had gone to fit and taken my courses for marketing art understanding typography and vuhulu and then going from there working at art school definitely you know was was uh, you know an incredible experience being around such a incredible team that puts out such quality projects on a on a weekly basis i mean they were at that time they were putting out 50 titles a year 50 roughly one a week wow and 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 being that environment had definitely given me an incredible amount of training for understanding the business world Interesting. Very interesting. How many employees do you have now? Do you do everything in house, or do you outsource any stuff? Uh, so that's a uh, you know very fair question, especially in today's day and age where where you can outsource. My stuff. We we have a team of thirteen, and right. and every kamat everything is done in house. There are sometimes if if let's say there's a particular overload and we need to outsource, we'll do that, but on a very very seldom basis. And the reason is, uh, and and and. and I, I don't want to take anything away from outsourcing because there's some that have gotten that to work. Some, however, we like to have a very, very tight view on everything we're producing for a client. So we have found that when we just outsource, especially because most of the work is creative work. So if it's just outsourced and then it comes back, many times there are nuances that are lost in the communication and it just adds many extra rounds. So whereas I'm sure for many industries, outsourcing can work and works well. So I'm not, I don't want anyone to misinterpret that I'm knocking outsourcing. Right. But when it comes to the creative process, we have tested it. We have found that it just there, there's 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 a loss a lossage in the translation, and therefore it it it, it can cause a frustration and a delay in time. So we personally we, we we do not outsource in general. Gotcha. So tell me a little bit about this radio show that you have. How did yeah. that come about, and when does that air? Yes, yeah, so that's very interesting. Uh, a couple of months ago, it's actually in. Uh, May of this year, so a chaver of mine from person had some type of connection with uh, 77 WABC. That's the you know the legendary WABC we all grew up. We right, Bob Grant and Rush Limbaugh right. and Jay Diamond, Vahulu. and <laughs> and and he said there's a slot. It's Sunday night. It's 11 to 12, and they're looking to do a business show. Would you be interested? I was like, interested? Okay, <laughs> you know what's involved. So okay, there was a type of package that had to be put together and barter, etc. But the main thing was that they, we had to prove that we could come up with a a, a weekly, uh, consistently a weekly schedule that of of great guests and real content for for the radio station. So we we made that presentation. And Baruch Hashem, it's been the rest is history. We started in early July of this year, so this will now complete six months. And we've had we've had an incredible guest. I mean, we had uh, our goal is to get C level executives or, right. or or executives that are are uh, you know out there or, or shouldn't say executives necessarily, but businessmen and 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 people out there that could share incredible perspective and advice. So, for example, well, we had Captain Sully Sullenberger who landed the plane at the Hudson. So the concept, wow. yeah. Now, now people, you know, people asked me before, and I said, "Wow, that's a great name." But what shaykhs does it have to business? And the <laughs> and the and the real answer is, well, it, it, talk about you know staying cool under pressure. Every businessman faces pressure and faces uh, challenging situations. And right. and who would be a better person to talk about handling pressure than Captain Sully Sullenberger? I mean, he 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 dealt with uh, the ultimate uh, the ultimate 
challenge of a life. I mean, he had to be at 155 people on board. And if he didn't handle it cool, they, you know, they wouldn't be here. So we had someone like that. We had Stephen Aldridge. He's a senior vice president at GoDaddy. So we talked about websites. We talked with the general manager at Uber. We talked with Matt Britton. He's the CEO of MRY, and, you know, just to name a few. And we had a couple of uh, CEOs from Fortune 500 companies. We had the former CEO of Saks Fifth Avenue. We had um, this uh, Jim Malcolm. He's the president of Rico, Fortune 500 company. And just last week, we had uh, the CEO of Liberty Tax Service, also a Fortune 500 company, as, as my guest. So Baruch Hashem, that has been uh, developing well. That's not necessarily a, a Hamish approach. That's, uh, as, as you can see, it's really open to the public. But that Baruch Hashem has been working out extremely well. Fantastic. That's that's great. They come to the studio, or you're able to do it. Yeah. So in the beginning, when we you know we hadn't uh, you know, by now, we're short of insisting that they come to the studio. You know, it depends on the particular guest, but uh, depending on the type of uh, you know guest, if if we were someone with, like for example, Liberty Tax Service, uh, we we were supposed to do it in studio. In the end, there was a scheduling conflict, so we did it by phone. But in general, Jim Malcolm and uh, you know many of the guests at this point are actually in studio. And Baruch Hashem, uh, recently the Nielsen ratings came out that our show broke into the top ten in the New York area. Wow, that's fantastic! Yeah, d during that slot, actually, it, it for it's amazing the Nielsen how they I don't I don't exactly understand their formula, but I know that they are the go-to people and the most trusted name in terms of uh, statistics and formula. And sure. for males twenty-five and over, we actually came ahead of WINS during that hour. Cool. So Very yeah, cool. pretty cool. Baruch Hashem. I saw. I see that one of your other clients is LNR Distributors. That's uh, Mark Bodner. Right? Yes, yes, Mike Bodner. We do a uh, middle of a big project for him. I was just uh, with him last night. Very, very special individual. Was he on your airwaves? No, I'm trying to get him on the show, but uh, we haven't. Uh, I will be able... Hashem. I will try to work on that. I will try to work on oh, that. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, a very good guy. I was involved with the Mishpacha interview that he did um, a number of years ago, and um, very special person who's also, I mean, willing to share and advise people very special yeah i reached out to him once about a project and he was very forthcoming very willing to, to help out and give advice yeah really really incredible guy yes that's correct so okay so you did the you, you did the last uh bloomberg for mayor right uh mm -hmm. project that went out well mm -hmm. considering he won right yeah <laughs> yeah that was an 05 yes as an 05 so what about like who are you pulling for in the republican uh you know, primaries. Who, who are you going for? And who would be your dream client, I guess, of all the uh, candidates? So it's very interesting when you talk about that, because I'll split the question. Dream client is one question and who I'm pulling for. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I could guess who your dream client would be. <laughs> but believe it or not, you know, that's an interesting question because my dream client and uh, who I'm pulling for are not necessarily one in the same. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I know who your dream client would be. <laughs> <laughs> that may not necessarily be your uh, pick. Yeah, but in terms of a presidential race, it is interesting. In general, we have not been, you know, I should take that back. In 08, we did a little work for Giuliani. Oh, um, that's nice. Yeah, but our, our focus usually is on on uh, either in, in, on the state legislature, an assemblyman, a state senator, a governor. We have been involved in a governor race with Tom Galasano in 02. On the city level, for sure, congressional races. Um, presidential race is really a... Uh, is uh, is a different animal, and I know you know you got the elephants and the donkeys, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that that's as far as a client. But as far as you know, who I'm going for, it's honestly I have not made up my mind yet. You know, in turn on, I mean it's. A, Probably clearly going to be. Well, one. Do we assume you're going Republican? Yeah, or, uh, yeah I would vote. That, that's a no-brainer, you're saying. Yeah, I'm going to probably vote Republican. Although I am a registered Democrat, and most New Yorkers, that's actually something that uh, someone from the five boroughs would understand well. Uh, yeah. Because it, and and because then I could vote in the primaries and actually have have an effect where almost I mean you know the uh, the majority of all the elected officials in the five boroughs are Democrats. So if someone's registered as a Republican, I don't want to take the this away because people have encouraged uh, maybe we should register Republicans and have more of a say. But for now, certainly uh, as someone living in the five boroughs will have a far greater impact registering as a Dem over a Republican. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a, talk a little bit about you have a new book out. You're now an author. Uh, that's super exciting. 
Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? What's the book about? How did it come about? Yeah, so thank you very much. The book is called So What's the Bottom Line? And it's uh, published by Morgan James Publishing. So this is a publishing company out there in the world. They're, and, and they've gotten it into uh, Barnes & Noble. It's on Amazon. It's uh, Walmart, Target, etc. The book is, uh, it, the subtitle says it all, 76 Proven Marketing Tips and Techniques for Building Your Business and your personal brand. So the book is for entrepreneurs, it's for salespeople, it's for marketers, and it's really for anyone who wants to get ahead in the business world and be ambitious. So there's all types of material in here. There are, are many chapters that are specifically uh, regarding marketing, and we'll, we can get to some examples, but then there are many that have to do with general concepts, which are not necessarily marketing concepts. So for example, there's one chapter in here, the times demand urgency. We talk about deadlines. In fact, every chapter ends with a short, first of all, the, the makeup of the book, it's 260 pages, uh, roughly 266. And each chapter is roughly four pages, three to four pages long. So it's, it's, it's easy to read. So yeah, it's oh. easy to read. You could just pick it up, spend four or five minutes, put it down, and you don't have to feel like you're stuck in the middle. You read a chapter and then you move on. You can sit down, read one chapter, five chapters, etc. And each chapter ends with a bottom line action step. So for example, this is a two page, a two page chapter, the times demand urgency and the bottom line action step is beat your deadlines, but don't let your deadlines beat you. And I, mm. and we talk about it in just two pages, the importance of a deadline, because that gets things done, yet at the same time, how to make sure that, you know, you, you can handle it and deal with it as you approach the uh, impending deadline. So that's, that's uh, I guess, a short take about the book. And uh, actually, the foreword was written by the Honorable Bob Turner. I just oh, wow. I drop about that. That was the he was the one the uh, the congressional race that we ran in 2011. That was uh, Anthony Weiner had stepped down, and then there was a just a special election, and Bob Turner was running as a Republican against David Weprin as a Democrat. It was a quick race, and the odds that Bob Turner would win were very very slim. He was not. It wasn't just a a, a slim underdog. I mean, he was the outright underdog it was wasn't even a, it was roughly it wasn't even a chance the way many people had described it uh that he would win and we did pull off a major upset victory so we had remained close and then when when i was uh, nearing the completion of the book i had gone through a list of uh, you know who would be great to to write the forward and a number of people said wow if you can get bob turner to do it that would be great because bob turner i mean he was uh, he, he gained national fame he, he won the election but also he was a media executive for many many years so he's someone that could relate to the role of marketing and and, and business etc and he wrote a, a very very beautiful forward so that's he wrote the forward of the book Fantastic. What would, what made you decide to do the book? Did you is it something you've wanted to do for a long time? Did someone suggest it to you? How did that come about? Yeah, so the credit goes actually to uh, Rabbi Pinchas Lipschitz of the Ted Neman here in America. He had this was back in '09. He said to me, he said, you know, listen, times are tough for everyone. Perhaps would you pen a column in the Ated, a weekly marketing column? He said, it's a great idea. Let me think about it. Let me start to uh, sketch this out and see it's, you know, how viable it is, how much time it will take for Hulu. And I got back to him. You know, I got back to him in short order saying I would do it. And then it took you know, whatever it is, four to six weeks till we got, you know, everything lined up in order to pull off such a, a quality column. And then I started writing a column every week or you know, roughly every week all about, deadlines. all about yeah all about marketing and business etc and that got me thinking say hey we should uh, at, at some point let's do a book so actually there is a portion of the of the articles or the chapters that were culled or built upon from those columns in the Ated I mean they, they all were edited because remember in the Ated it could have a more Hamish feel and could use you know, sure. lingo, if you will. But in the book, the, that that it had to all be. It's a general market book. So, um, so, so he really gets the credit because it all started with that by by doing a weekly column in the Ated that got things going. That uh, hey, you know, maybe we should really do a book. Fantastic! It's great. It's great. Let me ask you some uh, some lightning round questions. Sure. It's a uh, it's a fun part of the show. Mm -hmm. What would you say? What? Well, I mean, you've started pretty young, but. The question is, what was the worst job you ever had, and what did you learn from it? 
<laughs> well, it put me on the spot. We we won't identify uh, where, but I'd say the worst. That's funny. Don't I guess want to identify? But go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> the um, it was probably I would have to say being a waiter. Being a waiter when I was let's say twelve or thir- whatever thirteen or fourteen, whatever the it was, was was really challenging. As anyone, however, it's very healthy. It's very interesting. Sometimes people will ask me on a resume, should they put down um, some of their early work? Now, of course, it depends on how much they're showing on the resume. But when someone's getting started, they say, if I was a waiter or I was a JC, should I put that on a resume? And the answer is yes, because you want to show that you dealt with challenges and difficulties. And, and in fact, there's uh, one of the star members on my team who I, I won't identify, but worked at a grocery store uh, for a number of months. And I took that as a big mila because that means they dealt with, you know, customers. yeah, they dealt with customers. So I would say the worst job I had was for being a waiter. But yet I learned to, you know, sometimes if I, you know, the, the person was just grouchy or cranky or whatever the case was, and the waiter just has to put on that smile and deal with it and deal with people in whatever mood they happen to be in. And you just have to kind of just glide right through it. So that was uh, the most challenging uh, job. Great. What would you say is the best advice you ever received? Yeah, that uh, many years ago, uh, I received this advice from a friend that I'm still very close with. His name is David Shield. Uh, he lives in Bergenfield, New Jersey. He has a uh, is a marketing firm specifically for the for the uh, for for really the the healthcare industry. He has a lot of nursing homes and and hospitals. Hulu, very special individual. And I remember being and I, I we did some work with him many years ago and he there was a certain a project we were doing for him and he was you know asking me a number of questions about the deadline when he'll see it etc and i remember he he made something very clear he says yitzhak you have to understand uh, what's going on in the client's mind he says and communicate that so he he stressed the the importance of communication to a very very great degree it made a great impression on me mm-hmm. obviously i had i i was i had to get great advice from rabbi mayor zlotowitz i was very close to him another person who i was very close to and uh, is rabbi nachem stillerman I'm not sure if he's familiar to the listeners i did interact with him and of course uh, rabbi david goldwasser who i also remain very close with also received constantly great advice but but that one from david Schild about always making sure what's going on in the client mind and to understand that and had to make sure that i communicate whatever whatever's supposed to be communicating or but to communicate it in a way that it's really being received fantastic fantastic that's great advice great advice tell us a marketing horror story and how you overcame it <laughs> It is a very interesting one. We were doing a we were doing the marketing for a particular major event, and this was really I mean, you talk about uh, going into the event. Everything had been set up. Obviously, Saif Maisav Machshav Atchila. It's so important for everyone to to plan in advance. But a person always has to be flexible if there are last minute changes. So going into this event, the main organizer. Actually, the, the the mother of the main organizer had been Nifter. So like two days before he was out, he was sitting Shiva. Wow. Two days before the yeah. major event, mm-hmm. the guy the, getting his money? Yeah. Wow. And this person was the one who, he was the go-to person. He was running the event. And then at the same time, on the team of uh, that, that I had assembled in terms of reporting and, and preparing media, etc. So... My main person actually had some type of a medical emergency while I was in the hospital. Um, and that happened on, the, on I mean, the day, the day of the event. Um, wow. I mean, going into the event, there were just many, many things that were very challenging. And that had been, in, and actually was a hurricane here in the Northeast a week before. <laughs> I mean, you talk about, else, there was a hurricane. You talk about the perfect storm and no pun intended. Right. This was it. Was like, a lot of things that just... You know, Misa Sutton, just everything kind of just plopped right in the way. And wow. and it was extremely challenging. However, as far as how a person could, could overcome that, first thing, first rule of thumb is take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> and I really mean that because, it, yes, there's going to be some sweating. It's going to be tough. And, and I'm not sugarcoating that a challenge like that is, 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 is really a serious challenge. I'm not sugarcoating it. However, a person has to also let their mind just think for a minute because under those situations, it's very challenging to let the mind come up with, with, with creative solutions because we're under the gun. It's, it's under serious pressure. But yet, you need to have some, some you, know, you got to 
take a step back, be misbal, atachayin in ladam das, you know, really daven hard, that, that the mind comes up with great suggestions and solutions to deal with an impossible challenge. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, everything fell into place and, and, uh, you know, wound up working with, um, you know, I guess <laughs> those are times that you definitely have to outsource. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and by the way, there's another important takeaway is a person should always have down a list of potential, you know, go to people in case of an emergency. I mean, it's known. Yeah. I mean, it's known that, for example, sports teams will have, you know, they, they, they have their team that shows up on the field. But then there are people in the back office that have a list of uh, whoever's in the minors and whoever's even on other teams, whatever it is, because on a moment's notice, if, it, if a player goes down is injured, they're going to need to have someone up either the same day or by the next day. So a person should always prepare themselves. And as we do here at Bottom Line, we do have certain lists for go to people in, in various scenarios. Amazing. Very, very good advice as well. And uh, that is a crazy story. Yeah. The show went on and uh, everybody was happy. Nobody knew what was going on behind the scenes. I mean, to, to a very big degree, it was masked. That's, uh, you know, a very fair question. You know, maybe some of the seasoned veterans would have picked up that there was, uh, you know, a, a hiccup here and there. But in general, it went off extremely smoothly. We even had, uh, because again, this person had been, uh, you know, had, was starting to sit shiver. I think on Wednesday, it was a Shabbos event. There was a star that we brought in from Eretz Yisrael, actually, who landed from Friday morning, hit the ground running. It was another veteran in the in the industry who stepped in from Lakewood. I mean, this was it was really an incredible story of how it all came together. But in general, it was with, with you know very 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 smoothly. Baruch Hashem. Beautiful, beautiful. What would you say? What is one book you would recommend besides yours? What <laughs> book would you recommend to our listeners and why? You know. It's very interesting because there, there are so many different ones. One particular one that I'd recommend is called What Clients Love by Harry Beckwith. And it's uh, it actually the subtitle is A Field Guide to Growing Your Business. And the reason why I happen to to love that one is because he also, it's very short chapters, and he talks in there about all types of day-to-day communication and, and strategy and advice that really could uh, set a person uh, clear with great perspective. I know, for example, he has in there one chapter that I love. It's called The Velvet Sledgehammer. And in it, he talks about, like, uh, for example, a salesperson. We know some salespeople are a little pushy and they go over the line. They turn off prospective customers. Yet at the same time, a salesperson has to be ambitious, has to have drive and has to be on top of getting the sale. Otherwise, it could slip away. So The Velvet Sledgehammer, that chapter, gives great perspective on staying persistent, yet at the same time doing it, you know, with a velvet touch. So that's a particular book I'd recommend for the island. Excellent, excellent, beautiful. I, I'm sorry, okay. if I can, even one more, it's interesting, a new one sure. uh, called Think Big, Act Bigger by Jeffrey Hazlett. He was actually a guest on my show and also in the air, it's a great book about, he was actually a, a, a CMO at Kodak and he was there for a while. <laughs> the yeah, but yeah, we <laughs> certainly, you know, many of us grew up with Kodak. We knew sure. it was a, a major muscle. I got three Kodak disc cameras made bar mitzvah. Yeah, yeah we all remember <laughs> those. <laughs> That's another book also that I'd recommend. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, we're going to link to that one as well. All right, uh, final question. What is one business idea for a new business that you're willing to give away to our listeners? I, I like this question just because, you know, there's so many business ideas out there. And I'm sure, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you probably come up with ideas, but we don't always get a chance to share them. And sometimes we hold on to them. But what is one, if you have one, that you're willing to share with our listeners? So, uh, yes, 100%. You know what? I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share it. One is a, is a business idea, and the other is that I actually am giving away a free chapter in the book. I, I have a link on the site for the book. There's a special site, so what's the bottom line dot com, and on that there's a there's a box where someone could just click in, and it's actually an incredible chapter. It's called the Eleven Power Words of Marketing, and we go through the eleven power words. And this was based on research done by Yale University. So it's a, a real study that was done and uh, it's really incredible uh, stuff. I mean, this is real secrets giving away. But to answer your, your point directly, I would say, if I may, I'm, gonna, I'm going to answer it from a marketing perspective. And that okay. is 
whenever you create your marketing materials, be it an ad, be it a, uh, a print ad, be it a radio ad, be it a brochure, make sure that the call to action is clear. Because I've seen this violated so many times and unfortunately so much money is then lost. So I'll explain. Let's say there is a, um, a brochure brochure that's being sent out, or we'll say a Chinese auction catalog. So at the end of the day, we're looking for people to call, looking for people to go to a website or to get involved. Is that information clear? Is the phone number clear? Is the website information clear? There have been times I've seen big brochures go out and you have to look for that information. That's a terrible mistake because you always want to make sure that the, that the ability to convert for this person that you spent so much money trying to impress is clear. Because if they get uh, distracted and then they, you just lost the sale because you didn't communicate clearly through the call to action. So, and if, let's say it's an ad and the ad has to do with a certain event. Make sure the date is clear. And I, I say it, you, you probably, you know, you may be scratching your head like that's so obvious, but, right. but it's so true. Cause, and, and I see how important it is to stress this because I see many campaigns and, and literature and ads where the call to action is not clear and they're really losing a lot of, uh, a, a lot of money in the process because, because they're not communicating what the action step is. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Yitzhak, this has been great. It was so good to hear your story, learn more about you, learn more about Bottom Line Marketing Group, your radio show, your new book. Really exciting things. I look forward to you know hearing more exciting things from from you and from Bottom Line Marketing. And uh, you know, I want to again thank you for taking the time and for coming on the show. Oh, you're very welcome. And again, a special yeshakayev to you. It's a tremendous chesed that you're doing. Tremendous chesed. We know that many in the firm community did not get professional training, and therefore, by having access to programs like yourself, there, this is just like you know, free college, as they say. And it, it really is. It, it's tremendous chesed that you're doing, Nachum. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Yisrael, and thank you again. Excellent. Kol tov. Kol tov. Thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nahum Kligman. We hope you learned something valuable and will share this with your friends. For show notes, archives of previous episodes, and more information to help you start and grow your business,